Hello, everyone. My name is Harold Furch, Scott Roth, and I'll be your host today here at the Center for the Economics of the Internet at the Hudson Institute. Before we get started, I just want to make a, a few brief announcements before introducing our special speaker today. First, I would like to recognize uh, my colleague, Chris DeMuth, who in a couple of days is going to be receiving the Bradley Prize, one of the highest awards uh, in our nation. And we're all very proud of him here at the Hudson Institute. In May, we have a couple of uh, talks coming up. Ron Cass, former chairman of the International Trade Commission, and uh, Dean Emeritus of Boston University Law School will be speaking on May 2nd. Three weeks later, on May 23rd, Marsha Blackburn, chairman of the Telecommunications Subcommittee of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, will be speaking. Uh, we hope you can join us for both of those events. For, the, for our online viewers, uh, if you wish to submit questions or comments, our Twitter handle is at Hudson Events. Uh, so please, uh, please uh, feel free to send questions in and, uh, and comments as well. Today, we are honored to have with us Ajit Pai, Chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. Ajit is a great friend. It's good to have him back here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, I don't have to tell you about his uh, CV. Uh, uh, Chairman Pai was born, uh, was raised in rural Kansas in small town America. Uh, he has was, uh, received an undergraduate degree from Harvard, law degree from the University of Chicago. His CV is one career triumphed, uh, leaping to another, and now he is uh, chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, we are greatly honored to have him here at the Hudson Institute to speak about economic policy at the FCC. Uh, this is a topic that uh, I know the dozens of economists who currently serve at the commission and who have served at the commission in past decades are thrilled to have a chairman of the FCC speak at a public event about economic policy. Uh, this is a day that's been long in coming. We are greatly honored and very much looking forward to your comments. Chairman Pai. John. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, Commissioner Roth, for the uh, very kind introduction. I especially appreciate your description of my CV as a series of career triumphs, because if you ask my mother, she'll still tell you that I can't keep a job for more than two years. It's just, but uh, I also want to recognize, before I get into my formal remarks, uh, my terrific coworkers at the FCC. Would those of you who are at the agency please stand so I could uh, recognize you? I especially want to note the economists in our group who are here. They are the prize assets of this agency, and it is simply an honor to labor alongside them on these critical issues. Thank you for your service to the commission. Thank you for your service to the country. And for me, I, what an honor it is to be introduced by Harold Furchgit Roth uh, for a speech about economic analysis at the FCC. I'm a Stanford PhD in economics, and the only economist ever to serve at the FCC. I mean, this is like Bruce Springsteen bringing a garage band on stage uh, to cover Born to Run. So there's a lot of pressure on me this afternoon. Uh, thank you to the Hudson Institute for in hosting me today. And thank you as well for your valuable scholarship. It's helped to improve public policy and, in turn, the welfare of the American people. Now, as you know, I'm here to discuss the role of economics at the FCC. This is more of an academic topic and more serious audience than I'm used to addressing. So naturally, I would like to begin by talking about sports. Uh, this week marked opening day for baseball. America's pastime has changed dramatically since we were growing up. Uh, the players are bigger, stronger, and faster. Uh, the teams are smarter. And believe it or not, the Chicago Cubs are the defending World Series champions. <laughs> Now, these last two items are actually related, and they're highly relevant to today's discussion. Well, how is that, you might ask? Well, the answer, as with so much in life, uh, can be traced back to Kansas. Uh, in the 1970s, at a pork and beans plant in Lawrence, Kansas, 
A boiler room attendant named Bill James came up with a revolutionary idea. Use statistical analysis to test if the conventional wisdom about baseball was in fact correct. James ran his analyses while keeping an eye on the furnaces during the night shift that he ran. And it turns out, as he found, that a whole lot of that conventional wisdom was simply wrong. Baseball GMs and managers routinely made decisions that were provably unsound, such as valuing batting average over on base percentage. For decades, James's writings had a cult following, but they were largely ignored by major league teams. But finally, at the turn of the century, a new generation of James's disciples began to get jobs running ball clubs. And they used advanced analytics and other tools to give their teams a competitive advantage. And lo and behold, those teams began winning a lot. One of those executives was Theo Epstein, who read James's book at, in the fourth grade. And at the ripe old age of 28, Epstein became the general manager of the Boston Red Sox. And he actually hired James to work for the Sox. Just one year later, they built Boston's first World Series champion in 86 years. And last year, as you know, Epstein helped the Cubs end its own 108-year drought, uh, which was a remarkable thing. Now, just imagine if Theo Epstein said tomorrow that he was going to reduce the influence of the Cubs' analytic unit. Imagine if Bill James said, you didn't really need empirical data as long as you had some compelling anecdotal evidence. And it would be simply unthinkable in today's environment. And yet I worry that that is essentially the path that we've been following recently at the FCC. Historically, the FCC had been a model for the use of economic analysis and federal policymaking. We hired and we empowered a world-class set of economists to be on our staff. And in turn, they have delivered policies that were a much bigger deal than a Cubs World Series championship. They've unleashed hundreds of billions of dollars of value for the American consumer. But despite this rich legacy, staff economists are not guaranteed a seat at the policymaking table. Increasingly during FCC proceedings, their views have become more of an afterthought instead of an initial thought. Now, I think, is the time to restore the place of economic analysis at the Federal Communications Commission. And today, I hope to make the case to you why and how we should do so. If you were to read a textbook or an academic paper on the use of economics to craft uh, effective public policy, there's a decent chance that you'll find the FCC's spectrum auctions as offered as a prime example. Going back to the 1920s, when our agency was called the Federal Radio Commission, our government's method for allocating spectrum was what were known as comparative hearings. Over time, these became known as beauty contests. Potential licensees would come into the commission and try to persuade us that they should be awarded the rights to frequencies. The commission would then decide based on the case that it found appealing, and the winner would pay nothing but a small licensing fee in return. In the 1980s, we switched to lotteries, which had their own set of glaring flaws. But while all of this was going on, an economist was coming up with a better way. In 1959, future Nobel laureate economist Ronald Coase published a seminal paper with a very catchy title, The Federal Communications Commission. That was it. <laughs> uh, Coase argued that the government should treat spectrum like other property and allow markets, instead of whim, to decide who gets to use it. As he put it, based on basic principles of economics, it is not clear why we should have to rely on the Federal Communications Commission rather than the ordinary pricing mechanism to determine whether a particular frequency should be used. Now, this visionary principle eventually would be used, uh, would lead to auctions for spectrum licenses that we all take for granted today. Now, like a lot of great ideas, Cosa's theory was initially met with a lot of skepticism in Congress, in the industry, and in the commission itself. Uh, for instance, at one point, two commissioners said that the odds of spectrum license auctions being held were equal to those on the Easter Bunny in the Preakness. And that's an actual quote. But decades later, Coase finally carried the day. In 1993, Congress authorized competitive bidding for spectrum rights. And the auctions that have followed have raised more than $100 billion of value for the US Treasury. More important, they have facilitated the explosion of wireless services, services that have created millions of US jobs 
and have improved the American people's lives in countless ways. Now, spectrum license auctions are the most notable example of good economics guiding good policy at the FCC, but they're hardly the only one. As former FCC chief economist uh, Jerry Fallhaber and Hal Singer noted in a 2016 paper, economic analysis arguably reached its apex at the commission in the 1990s with an embrace of auctions as well as an embrace of antitrust principles to guide regulatory intervention in areas such as wireless telephony and the nascent internet. And more recently, the FCC has adopted the use of reverse auctions to efficiently distribute universal service funds. Now, this means that ratepayers, taxpayers, all of you with a phone bill who help finance broadband deployments get the most bang for your buck. And it also helps ensure that funds are more likely to be available to close the digital divide. Just last week, we concluded bidding in the world's first incentive auction, a two-sided auction that will reallocate 70 megahertz of license spectrum from television broadcasters to wireless companies. And notably, this novel auction design was initially proposed by FCC staff economist Evan Correll, together with staff engineer John Williams in a November 2002 white paper. I should also note that Evan also co-authored a 1985 white paper that provided the blueprint for the very first spectrum auctions. No telling whether Evan has gotten a commission over the years for his pioneering work in these areas. Uh, now, this brings me to the following point. As the economists Fall, Hubbard, and Singer have observed, the economic staff at the FCC is of high quality and no doubt the best in Washington in their understanding of the economics of telecommunications and the internet. And I could not agree more with that. But here's the rub. The FCC's first-rate economists are not always used optimally. It's a serious opportunity cost for us at the FCC and for the American public. Now, as I see it, there are four key problems. The first is that economists are not systematically incorporated into policy work at the FCC. Instead, their expertise is typically applied in ad hoc fashion, often late in the process. There's simply no consistent approach to their use. Not only is there a lack of clarity about when and how they will be enlisted, there's also no clear guiding principles for their work. Now, to me, the FCC should always take economics seriously because the alternative is effectively regulation by anecdote. And as Susan Dudley, George W. Bush's regulatory czar once noted, anecdotes about outcomes we don't like are, uh, do not indicate market failure, nor do they present a sufficient argument for government intervention. Now, the FCC should have the economic experts that it needs to identify market failures and study whether the benefits of commission action would be warranted given the costs. An in-house autarky, if you will. That's my joke for the economists in the room. But this is essential in all seriousness because otherwise well-intentioned but unsound policies uh, can effectively become unintended barriers to growth and to innovation. I'd also note one additional indicator of the diminishing influence of economists at the commission. Traditionally, FCC economists have crafted white papers that have been significant drivers of incredibly important policy innovations, such as the incentive auction that I mentioned earlier. Now, since 1980, FCC experts have submitted nearly 90 such papers. Since 2012, that number is zero. Now, I want to create a culture of economics at the FCC that supports big picture thinking like that once again. Now, the second big problem, Economists work in silos at the FCC. This impedes their productivity, and it also impairs agency efficiency. For example, at any given time, economists in one bureau could be quite busy, but economists in another bureau might not have that much work. And it seems to me that in a converged marketplace, economists with expertise in one context may be able to contribute significantly to addressing problems in another. And there can be great benefit from this cross-pollinization, if you will, of ideas. Uh, our economists are also capable of pinch hitting, if needed, in areas that are outside of their specialty. The FCC has many talented economists scattered across the agency, some of whom are here today. And I believe that there's great benefit to creating a place where economists can work together on a wider variety of issues. That's especially true when you think about the FCC in structural context. I mean, look across the government to see uh, how comparable agencies handle competition and consumer protection issues. At the FTC, for example, the Bureau of Economics has nearly 80 PhD-level economists. 
The Justice Department's Antitrust Division, where I once worked, employs an economic analysis group. The Securities and Exchange Commission has a division of economic risk and, division of economic and risk analysis. Now, each one of these offices is integrated into policymaking across those agencies, across those divisions. But we simply don't do that at the FCC. Now, the third key problem that I see with economic analysis at our agency is that cost-benefit analysis is largely ignored. The public interest standard has become essentially a free pass to adopt rules without a meaningful attempt to determine the costs and the benefits. The agency also hasn't taken seriously its duty under the law to conduct a regulatory flexibility analysis during rulemakings to consider how our rules might affect small businesses. And again, some context here, I think, is helpful. An invaluable resource on this issue is Cass Sunstein, President Obama's regulatory chief at the Office of Management and Budget, and, it so happens, my administrative law professor when I was a law student at the University of Chicago. And Sunstein has said, and I quote, it is not possible to do evidence-based, data-driven regulation without assessing both costs and benefits, and without being as quantitative as possible. Hence, as he put it, it is the duty of regulators to obtain a careful and objective analysis of the anticipated and actual effects of regulations, whether positive or negative. We need to look at evidence and data. We need careful assessments before rules are issued, and we need continuing scrutiny afterwards. I completely agree with Professor Sunstein. And thanks for the A, wherever you are, Professor. Uh, now, although the FCC is exempt from OMB guidelines as an independent agency, I think it's nonetheless helpful to look at the uh, framework that Sunstein developed for cost-benefit analysis and to use that as a yardstick. Uh, for example, according to OMB guidance, the best practice is to accompany all significant regulations with, number one, a tabular presentation placed prominently in offering a clear statement of qualitative and quantitative benefits and costs of the proposed or planned action, together with, number two, a presentation of uncertainties, and number three, similar information for reasonable alternatives to the proposed or planned action. So how does the FCC's economic analysis stack up to these best practices? Unfortunately, not so well. And here's an example. In compliance with the Regulatory Right to Know Act, OMB submits uh, an annual report to Congress that details the benefits and the costs of federal rules. Now, according to OMB's 2016 assessment just last year, the FCC issued 11 major rules between 2006 and 2015. And by their own count, not one was accompanied by an estimate of benefits or costs. Zero. Now, outside of major rules, the FCC performs cost-benefit analysis of uh, proposed rules occasionally instead of systematically. And seldom does it consider the distributional impact of these costs and benefits. For example, are the costs of a new rule simply too high to be borne by small firms that simply lack an army of attorneys or accountants for regulatory compliance? How will this impact competition or innovation in a particular market? As our host, uh, the commissioner wrote today in his new, uh, recently in his uh, new paper at, uh, about economics at the FCC, in the dozens of new rules that the FCC promulgates each year, one can find no precise statement that resembles an actual cost-benefit analysis, no projection of benefits or costs over time, no clear weighing of the risks associated with re various regulatory outcomes, and no plan for reviewing performance over time. Other than that, I think you are fine with the way we've been doing business. <laughs> but this practice significantly increase, uh, increases the odds that policies that do more harm than good get adopted and that actually produce net negative benefits. And a great example of this problem is the Commission's Title II order. The FCC's chief economist at the time of the Title II order's adoption has joked that it was, as he put it, an economics-free zone. It certainly didn't include a traditional cost-benefit analysis. He then clarified more seriously that, and I quote again, a fair amount of economics in it was wrong, unsupported, or irrelevant. Now, it's worth noting, however, that the Trump administration's re recently released executive order on regulatory reform specifically instructs teams to monitor compliance with cost-benefit guidelines established by both the Clinton and the Obama administrations. 
And this suggests to me, at least, that serious cost-benefit analysis is a bipartisan tradition. And it raises my hope that elevating the importance of economists and economic analysis at the FCC going forward will be a bipartisan cause that all of us can rally around. Now, the fourth big problem that I see with economic analysis at the FCC involves a key to good economics, and that is data. Uh, the FCC has often used data poorly. There is a real opportunity here, I think, to do better, uh, both in how data is collected and how that data is applied to make the best, most informed decisions possible. Now, on data collection, the FCC almost certainly collects uh, too much information through reporting requirements that are simply duplicative or unnecessary. And this imposes serious costs on everybody. In fact, according to OMB, the paperwork costs to comply with the FCC's rules are approximately $800 million each and every year. And that doesn't include the 73 million hours each year that private sector employees spend filling out paperwork instead of producing value for the American consumer, for example, by constructing next generation networks. But no matter how much or how little uh, information the FCC might collect, the real issue is what is done with it. For example, the Commission has a tremendous amount of information at its disposal regarding the commercial wireless market. But in spite of the fact that this agency has now issued 19 official reports, a few years ago, it simply stopped trying to determine whether or not this market was effectively competitive. Now, the various industries regulated by the FCC make up a critical part of the information economy. It's an incredibly complex market, and there's, there's very much that the FCC arguably can and should know. So guided by economists, economists and data experts and using data collected by the FCC and from other sources, the FCC can make well-informed, economically sound policy. So those are the four problems as I see them. And clearly, I think the state of the FCC's economic analysis and data collection is not where it needs to be. And so today, I'm launching a plan to fix it. Specifically, I'm pleased to announce that I'm beginning a process to establish an Office of Economic, Economics and Data, or OED. This office will combine economists and other data professionals from around the Federal Communications Commission. I envision it providing economic analysis for rulemakings, transactions, and auctions, managing the Commission's data resources, and conducting longer-term research on ways to improve the Commission's policies. Now, to inform our thinking on the wisdom of this proposal, we are establishing a working group of economists at the FCC that will be charged with thinking about some basic questions. Who should be part of this office? Who should be on other teams? How should OED be structured? How should it fit with the rest of the Commission? And what should be the powers and the responsibilities of this new office? Now, the working group is going to cast a wide net, seeking input from personnel at the FCC, including my distinguished colleagues, Commissioners Clyburn and O'Reilly, as well as stakeholders from outside the agency. And based on their findings, they will develop a plan of action by this summer. The Commission will then carefully consider that plan. And my goal is to have the office up and running by the end of the year. Now, while I look forward to detailed advice from the working group, I do see the Office of Economics and Data playing the following roles, roles that traditionally have been assumed by economists and other experts who are scattered around the agency. First, OED would give economists early input into the decision-making process. The FCC's rulemakings and transactional reviews and auctions have direct and tangible impacts. And it's therefore especially important that economics be incorporated at the beginning rather than at the end of the deliberative process with respect to these functions. Now, we're starting to do that already. I've tried to lead by example. One of my first hires for my own office was a PhD economist. And more generally, this month's infrastructure and special access items, which you can now see publicly, have required some very careful uh, and complex economic analysis. So I can expect the working group uh, will propose ways in which the Commission's rules should be modified and the office uh, can be integrated into the Commission's work. And that way, the FCC would be structurally and culturally inclined to incorporate economic thinking as a matter of course. Second major role, OED would ensure better management of data, reports, and analyses. 
The FCC should use its economists and its data experts, drawing upon best practices in data management and analytics, to ensure that well-informed decision-making is the norm, not simply a box to check. And I believe that the best way to do this is to put a single office in charge of making sure that that happens. We have the Office of General Counsel to make sure that our legal reasoning is sound. We have the Office of Engineering and Technology to make sure that our work reflects sound engineering policies. And we should have an Office of Economics and Data to make sure that our choices are informed by sound economic principles and solid data. Now, the Office should also take a careful look at paperwork filing requirements imposed by the Commission to make sure we aren't collecting information that is duplicative or unnecessary. Commissioner O'Reilly has called attention to the uh, tremendous burden that these requirements place on the private sector, and this office will work to reduce them. Additionally, Congress is taking an interest in this issue as well. The Consolidated Reporting Bill currently before them is a great example of how we could go about eliminating unnecessary reports. And I stand ready to work with them and my colleagues to implement the principles outlined in that or similar legislation. A third major role. OED would incorporate strategic, long-term thinking into the FCC's processes. There are a number of emerging challenges that we know we will have to grapple with in the future, if, even if we aren't devoted to uh, focusing on them right now. For instance, what is the impact on FCC policies of the Internet of Things, with billions of new devices dotting the landscape, operating at low power? What's the economic impact of the densification of wireless networks and higher demands for fiber backhaul on our long-range infrastructure rules. And then there are persistent questions that we constantly need to re-examine and reevaluate. What is the economic value of federal spectrum? What is the commercial value of unlicensed spectrum, and does it depend on the particular band? What is the impact of high-band spectrum on low-band spectrum policy, and on the mix of licensed and unlicensed spectrum? Now, in addition to the white papers I've already mentioned, which laid the groundwork for the Commission's first auctions and then later the broadcast incentive auction, other white papers have provided the economic arguments needed for the Commission to move from rate of return to price cap regulation for local exchange carriers. Still other work showed how the Commission could increase competition and lower rates for U.S. consumers in international telecommunications markets. And we intend to restore this tradition of staff economists spending time thinking about the future and publishing in the present influential white papers that keep us from being stuck in the past. We need bright people who can focus on big picture, out-of-the-box thinking. And the FCC's history shows how truly valuable this can be for the agency and ultimately for all of us, the American people. You know, looking back, the contributions by economists is long. And looking forward, it's critical that the Commission's economists continue to contribute in this way, carefully considering the next set of difficult issues and how economic insights might help address them. Finally, by establishing organizational structure and a culture in which economists contribute meaningfully to the Commission's work and are valued by, for doing so, we will continue to recruit quality talent, the best economists in the country, to come to the Commission and to help us in our work on behalf of the American people. And so, ending where we started, uh, sticking with the status quo for economics at the FCC would be akin, I think, to a Major League Baseball team in 2017 shunning analytics. And I can't help but note here that my favorite team, the Kansas City Royals, won the World Series in 2015. And since they still use sacrifice bunts and prefer batters with low strikeout rates over high walk rates, Many people have argued that the Royals disprove the idea that you need to adhere to Bill James's theories in order to succeed in modern baseball. But, but as the Columbia and Yale and Vanderbilt and MIT grads in the Royals analytics shop will tell you, those people don't know what they're talking about. Uh, the Royals spotted a market inefficiency in the valuing of elite defensive outfielders. And they paired that with affordable fly ball pitchers, a three-headed bullpen, and the fact that they play in a spacious pitcher's park. And they created an elite run prevention unit that got them to the World Series for two straight years. And the point of all this is pretty simple. In baseball, as at the FCC, using analytics doesn't dictate what your choices will be. But not using it means that your decisions are more likely to go wrong. As the nation celebrates opening day, I am delighted and excited 
that the SEC is getting back into the business of economic analysis. So thank you to uh, Commissioner Fertrude Roth, and thanks to all of you for letting me a uh, free rider, so to speak, on your hospitality today. I look forward to working with you on this organizational innovation in the time to come. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh thank you, Felicia. Oh, I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, when you're silent like that, it makes me think I either did something very right or something very wrong. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the former, uh, let me assure you, uh, <laughs> and Mr. Chairman, that was one of the most remarkable speeches I've heard in Washington. Uh, I think Thanks. decades from now, people will look back on your speech uh, as a template for uh, uh, public service and um, uh, ideas about uh, how to, uh, to manage federal agencies. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, I, there, there's so much that you've said and have touched on. I, it's, um, I'm going to have to be very uh, judicious in uh, uh, not, uh, not keeping you here for the next week asking questions about <laughs> this. But, uh, um, I think if you're at a Pareto optimal way to structure the conversation. So. <laughs> Let me begin with Ron Coase, uh, who is, uh, was one of the great economic thinkers of, of all time. Um, and it is, a, it is fascinating that he, some of his most influential articles were about the FCC. Ron Coase was very focused on the concept of property rights and uh, markets for property rights. Um, and while you're exactly right, the commission was kicking and screaming for decades. They weren't going to do this. They weren't going to do this. But over time, it ultimately came about. Uh, how do you see the 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 use of cons as as a Chicago Law School graduate? Uh, how do you see the the concept of property rights uh, animating uh, not just the discussion uh, at the commission, but the ways in which uh, regulations are thought about and, and formulated? That's a great question. Uh, I still have very fond memories of him. He was a professor at the University of Chicago Law School when I was there, and I still remember the first time I saw him, seeing an elderly gentleman with an Australian accent, uh, uh, and having a chance to talk to him about you know, the problem of social cost and the nature of the firm. And only, you know, I was a 21, 22-year-old kid, didn't know anything. And to realize later, I just have spoken with one of the greatest economists in history about some of these issues. It's just, it's, it was an incredible privilege. And so some of his insights, you know, the initial allocation of a property right isn't uh, as important if transaction costs are low and you can, uh, you know, eventually that property right will flow to the highest valued user. I mean, that has tremendous importance to what the FCC does. Uh, when we're talking about spectrum policy, for example, uh, we want to make sure that we keep sec uh, transaction costs low in the secondary markets, for example, so that we can make sure that the spectrum, the public resource, is allocated to the entity that will do the most to deliver value for the American people. And that's just one of many, many examples you could choose about how important it is uh, for COSIS theories to, to play a role in our policymaking. And uh, there are many more you know, in terms of wired infrastructure and wireless infrastructure that we can think about how to incentivize uh, companies to take the risk to, to spend massive amounts of capex uh, building these next generation networks. Uh, that's ultimately a property right that uh, we have to make sure is uh, preserved in order to maximize the incentive for them to keep doing it in the future. And, uh, it cuts across every area that we uh, that we regulate. So it would be uh, reasonable to hope, or uh, that that the commission might uh, think uh, a great deal about property rights and say wireless spectrum uh, to uh, facilitate transactions to to get spectrum into best and highest use. Uh, Absolutely. And obviously, there are complex uh, complexities to this area with, for example, Wi-Fi is one of the areas that has been such a tremendous success for consumers. And so hopefully, the, the smart economists that we have on staff can figure out a way to, uh, to thread that needle, so to speak, to preserve uh, the tremendous value American consumers can get from both licensed and unlicensed spectrum. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think, one of the things that has uh, been very valuable to the commission to have their expertise bearing down on these issues. You discussed the uh, executive orders from both President Trump, but 
but really for decades, presidents have had executive orders on the way that regulations should be done in executive branch agencies. The FCC, of course, is exempt from most of those because it's not a, an executive branch agency. Yet those are simply orders that are yeah, an independent agency such as the FCC could on its own. As, and it, it seems like you are suggesting that under your leadership, the commission will in fact adopt things uh, not because you're required to by executive order, not because you're required to by, by statute, but because in, in your judgment, this is the right way that a, a government agency should operate. Absolutely. I know that there are going to be you know, legal uh, questions that attend to any executive order like that. But to me, the bottom line uh, question for any regulator, but especially this one, is do the benefits outweigh the cost for this particular rule that we're adopting? I think that's a question the typical consumer uh, finds amazing that the commission even has to, <laughs> has to ask. I mean, you would think that any regulation shouldn't be adopted if it, if it produces net negative benefits for the American people. And so that's going to be the paradigm that we uh, try to view everything we do um, in the coming years uh, is through you know, to make sure that we're actually producing value uh, with some of these regulations we adopt. And you mentioned the public interest standard, which uh, animates much of the Communications Act. Uh, do you see uh, uh, making aligning the public interest standard more clearly with cost benefit analysis? I do think that we need to infuse some economic rigor into that standard, so that it's not simply a question of you know, putting your finger in the wind and trying to figure out. Uh, uh, what you think might be the best policy based on uh, you know, the vicissitudes of, of uh, this or that preference of the day. But I think that uh, certainly cost-benefit analysis is a core part of that public interest standard. It's, uh, I mean, it's hard to think of something that would be in the public interest but for which the net <laughs> benefits are actually negative, for instance. It uh, kind of deserves the entire idea of the public interest standard in a lot of ways. So we want to make sure that we, uh, as I said, infuse more uh, economic analysis into our thinking about how that standard should be applied. Do you envision uh, OED uh, being involved with the uh, Section 11 review of regulations affecting uh, telecommunications carriers? Absolutely. I think a biennial review, as it is known, has uh, been neglected for a long time. And uh, uh, both I and Commissioner Riley have talked a lot about the need to make that a meaningful exercise, to take a look at all of the rules that are on the books. and to figure out whether they remain necessary in the interest of competition and the public interest. And uh, that is a policy question. That might be a technical question. It might be even be a legal question, but it's also an economics question. And so we want to make sure that OED uh, has a chance to sit at the table and, and uh, proactively identify for us rules that um, we might not be aware of that uh, are actually standing in the way of uh, growth or innovation or, or otherwise not reflective of the modern marketplace. I have endless questions about uh, OED. I, I think this is just a great idea. Uh, but uh, let me not uh, monopolize the, uh, the questions here. I'm sure we have an incredible audience here, uh, both in person and online. I'm going to open it up the floor to questions, and, uh, uh, and then I'll intersperse a few uh, as, as we go along. My good friend here, yes. Oh, and please uh, uh, wait for the microphone and identify yourself for Hi, right, Larry Spivak from the Phoenix Center. First, an observation. Sitting where I'm sitting, those are some really decorative hoes. <laughs> I take those, man. It's a present sweet. for my wife. So. OK, um, two, re two related questions. Um, having been practicing telecom law for 24 years, this is not the first time the commission has attempted to set up uh, Office of Economics. The first was back the original OPP, where I there was my good friend Jerry Duvall there. And back then, you had people like Jerry and Mike Pelkovitz and Nina Cornell, and they did some really serious work. Um, and then I was part of the now defunct competition division in the 90s. And we lasted about four years. And eventually, the bureaucracy just so we'd like to joke, it did such a good job to send us home. Um, but I can tell you that you, know, you, get, you start fighting the embedded plant, so to speak. And um, it's just very hard to bring rigor to it, you know, when people don't want to face it, when you face in a political business doing that. So my first question is, number one, how is that going to change with your administration? And then secondly, given the level of economics, I think there's a pervading view in Washington that because the FCC over the last eight years has been so highly political that there is no market at the FCC for serious work. 
And um, how then are you going to be forcing stakeholders to step up their game and move from collectivism to actually doing some serious work to bring to your attention? And hopefully is there going to be some sort of a peer review process where you're going to go, that's a good story, that's not a good story? Because there's a lot more economics than just the cost benefit. It's, for example, like the right. virtuous cycle doesn't make any sense, but yet we went through it. So that's my questions. Agreed. So as to the first, I mean, I realize that this is not uh, the first bite that uh, a chairman has tried to have at the apple. Uh, this has been a longstanding issue. Uh, but what I can say is I'm very committed to uh, heightening the importance of economic analysis at the FCC. I've had a chance to meet with some of our economists uh, prior to the speech. And what I told them is what I'll tell you. When I was in the Office of General Counsel, uh, heading up the Administrative Law Division, one of the things I found very valuable was the chance to have a bird's eye view on everything the Commission was doing, media, wireless, wireline, satellite, you name it. And it seemed to me that that made our uh, work product, the FCC's work product, a lot better because OGC could weigh in early and spot legal issues and help the Commission try to find a policy path that uh, was more legally sustainable. In the cur current environment, economists uh, within OSP and the other bureaus and offices are somewhat scattered. They don't have the ability to take that, uh, to have that centralized function so that they have a bird's eye view in everything the commission is doing. And as a result, if a commissioner's office or a particular bureau has a question about an economics matter, they might not even know who exactly it is they should talk to. Uh, the economists might be left out of the process or they might be brought into the process as an 11th hour. You know, oh my gosh, we've already chosen this policy. Uh, let's go see if the economists think it works, which is not exactly the way you would uh, optimally structure things. And so our hope is that if by creating an OED, they will become the resource for economic analysis and data analysis at the commission. And we can bring them in early. Uh, one of the things I've tried to institute, in addition to uh, this pilot project of uh, making all these documents public, is also incorporating all the bureaus and offices into the decision-making process earlier to make sure that they're aware of what we're uh, trying to do. And that way, uh, they won't be taken by surprise. And so you know, reifying, so to speak, uh, the, economist fun the economic function through the use of an OED, I think, would be one critical way of making sure that they are guaranteed a seat at that table, especially to the extent it involves you know, changes to our rules or uh, just dedicated uh, cultural change that is led by the chairman's office. Uh, with respect to the second problem, I think it is going to be more difficult for uh, a lot of people in the private sector to they come up with this information, but nonetheless, it's an important thing to do. I mean, it's one thing for us to say, oh, the FCC needs to adopt cost-benefit analysis. That analysis can only be done based on the record that we have. And so it's incumbent, I think, upon people who have an interest in commission rulemakings and adjudications to come to the table with concrete facts and uh, evidence as opposed to rhetoric and say, look, these are the number of hours it would take to comply with this requirement, or these are the potential benefits uh, from tweaking this rule that you could gain uh, for the American economy. And that's the kind of thing that we really need. And so uh, I'm hopeful that uh, they'll be able to do that in a way that allows us to make more informed decisions going forward. And thanks for the comment about the socks. <laughs> Lady here. Hi. Barbara Espen, Cinnamon Mueller. Great speech, Thank uh, you. Mr. Chairman. I have a two-part question. Okay. I, I think the first is a pretty easy one for you to answer. Does this change in structure require congressional approval? In an, and I'll also, related to your creation of an Office of uh, Economics, you have an office in the commission, the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. Right. That weighs in on the reg flex analysis, but late in the game. Do you have plans for um, getting them in earlier in a more significant way integrated with the OED plan? So uh, in terms of integration, that's one of the issues I would anticipate that our working group will take a look at to figure out, as I said, you know, who would populate OED, how it w would work with other existing offices and bureaus. So uh, not to pass the buck, but that's one of the issues I hope they will take a look at. As for the former, I do think we have ample legal authority to you know, improve our organizational structure without additional authorization from Congress. And so based on my own reading of the act, and uh, I think that it would be very doable. The Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, as you might recall, was created uh, several years ago without additional congressional authorization. And so uh, I think we should be fine on that score. Uh, Mike Nelson right next to. I'm Mike Nelson with Cloudflare, a web security firm. And I want to give you two more tasks for your new office to do. Okay. <laughs> Our company has data centers in over 55 countries. And we buy a huge amount of bandwidth from hundreds of different ISPs. 
So a lot of my time is spent looking at international telecom policy, mm -hmm. where the lack of economic analysis is even worse. Is the new office going to spend some time helping other countries figure out how to do better analysis? And while they're at it, are they also going to have a few technologists in the room so that they can tackle these future-oriented issues that you listed? Both great questions. I, to be honest, I hadn't contemplated the international uh, role of OED, but I do think that, for example, we want them to participate in economic conferences. We want them to uh, do papers that are available to people around the world. Um, I've noticed in my own uh, you know, liaisons with my counterparts from abroad that there is a lot of information that is shared from us that they take very seriously. And so I would hope that uh, our colleagues on the economic side would do the same uh, with their counterparts uh, going forward. Uh, with respect to the second piece of it, which was, gosh, I've already forgotten now. Uh, technologists, yes. So, yeah, there are some fantastic technologists at OSP and throughout the building. And I would imagine that's one of the issues that the working group is going to try to figure out is that you know, there's no clear delineation necessary between uh, sort of the economists and the uh, data analysts on one hand and the technologists. We recognize there's sort of a fuzzy line there. But one way or the other, uh, when a decision is going to be made, we would like to bring all of those uh, disciplines uh, to bear on the particular questions, whether they're actually in that office or they're just incorporated uh, early on. Let's take a question from this side of the room, a lady here. Thank you. Uh, Julie Rones. I'm a telecom attorney. I've been around forever. Um, and I really applaud your speech. Thank you. And the recognition that one size regulation does not fit all. Right. Um, I used to represent the incumbent uh, local exchange carriers. And during Y2K and t truth in billing, came about at the same time. These were software changes that really overburdened the small and mid-sized carriers. Uh, we had to go before OB OMB and plead because they were getting crushed trying to make both of the regulations at the same time. So even though they're, they're independent, um, they didn't get involved with independent because of Y2K, they did. Right. Uh, so, uh, that was very helpful to uh, have a, a, a recognition, at the, but an OMB uh, helped stave off these um, burdensome regulations for small and mid-sized during that crisis. Great. But um, I also um, used to represent telecom consumers, and I applaud your recognition that uh, there are cost benefits that and the benefits really need to be fleshed out for the average consumer because that is a role of the FCC. So with economists, you really have to make sure that you don't talk in that heavy economist lingo <laughs> um, so that uh, regular people might understand the implications of how <clears throat> excuse me these regulations might fit them. So um, my stepfather at one time says, I may be getting old, but I don't understand what the short and long haul, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I right. think it's really helpful to flesh out the benefits from uh, people who are um, low income, the disabled, and those parties who would need to really um, be able to advocate that, well, this affects us too, and we want you to know these. we need this as a benefit. So that's what I would plead for the economists to please not talk heavy lingo and establish acronyms that the um, people who may be impacted would need to really understand. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. I, we really appreciate uh, that perspective. And uh, in my own personal statements, I've always tried to explain things in a way that would be more understandable to uh, the, the person who might not be uh, you know, specialized in this field, which is the vast majority of the American people. And uh, there's a great memo from Winston Churchill, I think in 1940, 1941, and uh, maybe I'll post it on Twitter later, but it's just something like, this is directed to his staff in the middle of World War II. Don't give me these long, elegant memos. I want clear, crisp sentences that get to the point and explain it in a way that I can understand it so we don't have to sit here and debate about what it means. And that's, I think, essential in our work as well, that it's very easy uh, to write a 200-page order that covers every single jot and tittle and includes all that legalese and economic speak. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that uh, everyone in the American public is able to understand our decisions. And so uh, one of the best uh, mentors I ever had said, it's really easy to write something long. It's really hard to write something short. <laughs> and uh, that, I think, is uh, this kind of goes to your point. We want it to be understandable and short, as concise as possible, so people know what we're doing. Gentleman in the front here. Hi.
Hi, I'm uh, Carl Herkenroder with PJ Media. Hi. Uh, thanks for being available today. I wanted to ask you about the, the current conversation uh, surrounding privacy and telecommunications companies. Yeah. I was curious, what's been missing from media reports as far as the general public is concerned, people that are uh, concerned about their privacy, what would you tell them that's been missing from media reports? And right. And second, what kind of role will OED have uh, moving forward with this issue? Uh, well, the answer to the first question is pretty simple. You can uh, go to the Washington Post and see an op-ed that was just published uh, with me and uh, Chairman uh, Maureen Olhausen of the Federal Trade Commission about this very issue. But the bottom line uh, is pretty simple, that we think that consumers have a uniform expectation of privacy when they go online and that it shouldn't matter what the particular classification is of the entity that handles their information. We want that information uh, to be protected in a consistent and comprehensive way. And so the Federal Trade Commission prior to 2015 had done a good job, I think, of uh, making sure that the online economy was one that protected consumers. And uh, that's uh, sort of the, uh, as you'll see in the op-ed, uh, it's, it's the vision uh, you know, that we've got is that we're making sure that consumers are protected uh, across the board. As to the second one, uh, we haven't really thought about how OED might uh, uh, think about those issues, but I would imagine, based on the recommendations from the working group, that this is the kind of issue that we would want them in early to uh, have input on so that they can flesh out for us some of the economic dimensions to uh, that and other uh, high-profile policy issues. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me, let me just follow up on that. Uh, it was a wonderful op-ed that, uh, that you and Chairman Olhausen wrote in the uh, Washington Post this morning, um, and I think uh, I will speak for myself. I think a lot of people were maybe pleased uh, to see both the Federal Trade Commission and the FCC write about this on an area that's been, shall we call it a turf battle for, in recent years. Uh, could that's you tell even, us a yeah. bit about uh, the, the, uh, how you see the role of the FCC and the FTC going forward on privacy issues online? Sure. Um, I mean, I think uh, it wasn't really a turf battle in 2015. We simply stripped the FTC of authority uh, by reclassifying broadband uh, uh, providers as common carriers. And so the work that the FCC had done, or FTC had done from the dawn of the Internet age until 2015 uh, was essentially down the drain. And then the FCC opened up a privacy gap. There were no privacy rules whatsoever on the books between February 2015 and October of 2016. There was some simply vague enforcement bureau guidance that didn't give anyone in the private sector any clarity. And so the point we've made is pretty simple. Uh, the FCC, by doing that, created a gap in privacy protection. And when it finally filled that gap, it doubled down on the error uh, by adopting asymmetric regulation, regulation that was more onerous on one sector of the economy and less onerous uh, by implication on other sectors of the economy. And so I think the goal always, and this and every other area, is to have a level regulatory playing field. Uh, and you know, viewing it from the eyes of our consumer, again, the expectation is that there would be a uniform uh, and comprehensive and consistent uh, protection of their sensitive information when they go online. And so that is, I think, the long-term vision. And uh, again, if economists can uh, help us uh, figure out a way to uh, calculate the costs and benefits in an optimal way, that's, uh, that's an important function too. Jim Coltharp with Comcast. Uh, excellent speech uh, for the economists from the FCC in, in the past. Um, keeping with your sabermetrics metaphor, the longstanding tension between uh, scouts in the field who supposedly really know baseball right. and the folks uh, behind computers has been well documented with a celebrated movie even. so. <laughs> Could you talk for a bit about how you might see OED fitting in with uh, maybe what has become a more uh, traditional work at the FCC? Well, that's a great question. Um, I guess it depends on the way and the time in which they're incorporated. So as I envision uh, the decision-making process of the agency, ideally, I mean, it's not necessarily this way now, though we're nudging in that direction, uh, when we come up with an idea, we would like to have people from various disciplines at the table to let us know what they think. And so, uh, for example, uh, we come up with a great idea and we say, well, we think this would be terrific for you know, reasons A, B, and C. 
uh, we, there might be a blind spot uh, that we're not thinking about from an economic perspective. And that person, uh, that economist could come in and she could tell us, look, no, there's also consideration D that you really have to think about. And you know, that could just wipe out all of the, uh, the, the, the justifications for this idea. And so incorporating them early, I think, is a critical thing. It prevents you from going down rabbit holes uh, that you might otherwise try to plunge down. And uh, essentially, uh, I think it would make the decision making a lot better at the end of the day. Like I said, I realize this is a tremendous imposition in some ways on staff at the front end because it requires a lot more people to have to do a lot more work. But think about it on the back end. Uh, this would result in fewer petitions for reconsideration because we have neglected an economic issue that is glaring. This would result in fewer applications for review. This could result in fewer petitions for review that are filed in court. Fewer of our decisions, ideally, uh, would be challenged in court on the basis of unsound economic thinking if we can demonstrate if, if we incorporate uh, that economic analysis up front and uh, you know, ensure, for example, that the benefits are outweighed by the costs. And so, I'm convinced that the long-term benefits of the dis this decision are going to be substantial and. Uh, uh, hopefully, my uh, my coworkers of the SEC will see it the same way. Uh, the gentleman in the back there, uh, Kyle Daly, Bloomberg BNA. So obviously, right now there's a federal hiring freeze, and even moving beyond that, the administration has signaled that it really wants to trim the federal workforce. So, how does that work? Are you going to reduce the size of other offices or bureaus? That's one of the core questions the working group is going to have to uh, talk about is uh, where to draw economists and data analysts from. We already have a, a really amazing staff uh, of economists and uh, uh, statisticians and the like that are sprinkled throughout the agency, including primarily the Office of Strategic Planning. And so uh, that's one of the uh, things that they'll tackle. But uh, I would imagine that we'll you know, make do as best we can, given the uh, tremendous assets that we've already got. Mr. Hershey. Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. In evaluating these benefits, would you be using a set of objectives and a weighted set so you can see what is important relative to other things and coming up with your final number for uh, what is the benefit? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, obviously, we want to use the best evidence that we can get. Uh, so um, I know that uh, the economists will hopefully, uh, with an OED, produce what they think is the most accurate uh, uh, analysis of what the benefits and costs are for any given measure. Um, obviously, there's always going to be some fuzziness about that. You can't quantify with mathematical precision, uh, OK, it's going to yield $10.86 benefit in benefits and $9.76 in costs. But, um, but we do want to try to evaluate the evidence as best we can. Uh, if weighting it is the appropriate thing to do under uh, basic economic principles, then I would be open to that too. But uh, you know, the end goal is always the same, to make the best judgment we possibly can based on the evidence that we have to reach a decision that uh, ultimately will speak well of us and uh, well of the regulation in question. I'm going to do one last question. Well, we're going to do two questions, the gentleman over there and then the lady in the front. Thank you. Hi, uh, Chairman. David Hatch with the Merger Market Group. Given that, given that the FCC often tag teams with the DOJ on merger review, is there the potential for some duplication of economic analysis, or would the FCC's economic analysis be different in some way than the DOJ, and, and how? That's a good question. We, we uh, would anticipate the working group will sort through that question, uh, among others, because uh, uh, right now, merger analysis of the FCC, it depends on how any given chairman structures the team that will evaluate any given transaction. And so our hope is that OED uh, would be involved in that process and help us uh, sort through what the evidence is. And you know, there, as you know, there's a great deal of exchange of information between DOJ and the FCC. And uh, yeah, I remember when I was working on mergers at the DOJ, uh, quite often we would share things like 4C documents to try to figure out, OK, these are the purported efficiencies that the and uh, uh, competitive benefits that the parties say are going to be produced. And we would share that with the FCC. And from the FCC perspective, we would want to have as much information like that as we could get in order to evaluate. And I would imagine that OED would uh, certainly, and that, that would be right within their wheelhouse. So uh, I would actually imagine it not being one of duplication, but of uh, closer collaboration and a consensus on a lot of these issues. I 
I think it would be improved. I mean, I think that uh, there are obviously a lot of considerations that go into it, but uh, making sure that economic uh, analysis is a part of it, I think, ultimately makes our uh, ultimate interpretation of the public interest standard a lot stronger, uh, even if it is more you know, broader than uh, just the the, uh, you know, the cost benefit analysis that we discussed. Lynn Stanton from TR Daily, and this is kind of a combined follow-up on Mr. Hersey and Mr. Hatch. Um, how, in an economic analysis, will you go about considering consumer concerns that aren't, where the, the cost to them is not something that's really part of the the economic, it's, it's, not, a, it's not an economic transaction, something like uh, a television station going off the air. With a television right. station, you can quantify their side, but the consumer side, the viewer side, or um, robocalls, you know, I'm getting interrupted during dinner, I'm not, you know, it's not time taken away from my job, but right. that kind of thing. That's a great question, and uh, I'll just use a very simple example. As many of you in this room know, I've been a big champion of AM radio, and one reason is that uh, localism is something that defines everything that they do. How do you put a value on the fact that if you're in Durand, Wisconsin, you can tune into WRDN on a Friday evening and listen to the local high school football game, or tune in on Sunday to hear the church service if there's too much snow for you to get out and go? I mean, it's it's impossible for an agency to try to quantify that, but there's a value to that nonetheless, a value that is embedded in some cases by Congress within the statute that we administer. And so um, obviously there are broader uh, non-economic uh, considerations that we have to take into account. And uh, you know, the purpose of OED and the goal of uh, heightening economic analysis is not to exclude those, it's simply to uh, realize that there are, uh, th these are very complex and textured decisions that we have to make. And so we want to make sure that economists have the seat at the table, but in the hypothetical that I uh, suggested, we want to make sure that folks from the media bureau have a seat at the table too, to let us know, okay, this is how many AM stations would go off the air or TV stations would go off the air if you adopted this or that rule. Those are, this, we're all in this together, so to speak. And so uh, this is a non-mutually exclusive uh, proposal that we're adopting or thinking I, about. And if I may interject, Mr. Chairman, uh, robocalls, uh, things that are distractions like that or are, are things that economists actually can and do measure. There's an extraordinary cost to that. And, and the, the value of having uh, an AM station is also something that uh, economists can, can uh, help, uh, help you quantify. Judging from the volume of complaints I get, the uh, the cost to the individual consumer approaches Robocall? infinity it is. asymptotically yeah, as uh, <laughs> as time goes on. So Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Last question to... Uh, member of our board, Margaret Whitehead. Thank you so much. Wonderful speech. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, what are the economic standards that the commission is going to use to evaluate the applications of these radical, the radical development of the spread of internet all over the world by companies run for like, by people like Greg Weiler and Elon Musk and Iridium and others. Uh, and what are the how does that work with the international implications of all of this? Well, that's a great question. I mean, as to the economic standards, I would have to defer to the, uh, the actual economists in the room who could uh, provide you much more uh, a much more informed answer. But as to the latter question, I mean, it's a uh, it's a huge development. I think uh, at the dawn of the internet age, I think no one could have foreseen that there would be all of these technologies that could connect people. Uh, billions of people around the world uh, with uh, you know, a broadband uh, connection. And so it's really, uh, it's, it's an exciting development, but there are some challenges as well, as you pointed out. And trying to understand the economic impact of it is something that I would hope that our experts in OED would be able to address. Um, and the benefits of it are tremendous as well. I mean, I've had a chance to see anecdotally, I mean, I know I batched anecdotes, but just to give you one anecdote, to be able to see the importance of connectivity abroad, it just, it really does make you realize that we are living in an age of wonder. I mean, I remember two years ago sitting on the outskirts of a dusty village uh, outside Bangalore and seeing a lot of poor women who for the first time were getting microloans so they could start their own businesses. And the key to getting that was their mobile phones. It was money that they got and could transmit by themselves. They didn't have to go through their husbands to get the money. And just to see the look of hope on their faces, it's yeah, I can't put my finger on how much economic value that generated, but if you multiply that across all the people around this world and how much you know, they could improve their societies, their families, and it's just tremendous. And so I'm really excited to, to see if we can find a way to quantify it. But I know qualitatively, it's something that makes me really optimistic about the future and so very grateful that I have a chance to, to work in these, uh, in these areas alongside so many talented public servants. 
And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, 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 no.